60% of the audience believe that their decisions are rational and logical. The conclusion is this, that every single decision you've taken in your entire life and you will take for the rest of your life, every single decision is driven by emotion or instinct. There are no exceptions. <laughs> So welcome to the show, David. It's a pleasure having you. How did you get started in storytelling, especially the research behind it? Uh, well, my passion has been communication my entire life. For me, that is the most single most important subject any human can learn. And about five years ago, I just started being really mesmerized by the effects of storytelling. And I, I, I got to think, how can it be so powerful? It's almost like it's mind-blowingly powerful. And whenever I find anything that is remotely mind-blowingly powerful, I just have to <laughs> dig into it. Absolutely. And I know for us this month, we've been talking a lot about the importance of emotions in storytelling, how to become a better storyteller. And a lot of our listeners and our clients ask us exactly that. How can we strengthen our storytelling skills so that mm -hmm. we can have a compelling interaction that, that becomes memorable? Because we've all been influenced by that one story that we held mm. on to and we loved, uh, but a lot of us don't feel that strong in this department. And how do we get practice in developing out our stories telling skills? Well, I would say that my, my recommendation is as with anything in communication, that is when I do training in communication, I do training in storytelling, people think that when they're on stage, that's when they're supposed to practice. <laughs> but that is entirely incorrect. So where you're supposed to practice is your everyday life. Your every single conversation, every meeting, by the coffee machine, by the car, wherever you are, that's when you're supposed to practice it. And then what happens is if you could become brilliant there, you are simply brilliant on stage. Now, the, my practical tip for what you should practice is the following. Now, whenever you're in a situation and it's at least remotely funny or remotely weird, or remotely strange or anything that sticks out, you should look at that situation from the four basic steps of storytelling. And the four basic steps of storytelling, as I teach, is a prep, background, development, and conclusion. So whatever strange situation you're in, you just form it in, in those four boxes in your head as you're standing there. And then you see, can I make that funny? Can I make that interesting? Can I make that even more weird or whatever? And then you try it on someone. And they are like, ooh, maybe they laugh. And they go, like, yeah, that's cool. And then you just tweak it a bit and tweak it a bit and tweak it a bit and tweak it a bit. And boom, you have a good story. That is the best way to learn storytelling. You do that every single day. My God, you'll be a storyteller in no time. I think, you know, lots of great things happen to us on a daily basis. And, it, uh, and you know, in those moments, we have that chuckle to ourselves. I mean, those are opportunities to make a mental note. And, and what's great about this is I started doing this a few years ago, it's like we have these devices in our pockets now, and I have a running pages of just interesting things and my perspective on it and why it stuck out to me that day. So that, you know, when I do go back, when I'm looking for stories, when I'm looking for anecdotes to, to showcase something, I have these things that are, that are where I'm the main character, but it's happened to me and, and I can, and that perspective, uh, allows for others to put themselves in my position and experience those things. Absolutely. That's a brilliant, that's a brilliant thing. Just copy paste that. That's superb. Well, the other point that you make that's so important is, is reading the audience and actually practicing on people to see their response. Because sometimes we can think a story is great when we only share it with ourselves and we're telling it in our head, but we don't yep. know how that story is going to sound until we actually start sharing it with people. True. Absolutely. Yeah. Now that's the thing. That's the way you learn storytelling. And uh, I like that idea by just writing down the different situations you're in and the scenarios that happen to you in your everyday life and you just package it. But I think the, the thing is to package it in real time where you are there with these four steps, because that is what really brings storytelling to life. So let's break down those four steps, the prep, the background, and obviously understanding storytelling to a great degree, it's important that we allow the audience to know where this is transpiring, where this story is beginning and, and a little bit of that backstory. So what is the prep? Okay, so I'll just give you a real time story then. 
you just called me, uh, let's see here, 22 minutes ago. I was at home. I was sitting with my kids. I was looking through a photo album. And I thought that we were going to go live, uh, live at 6.30. Okay, so that's a story for you. So I'll tell it the incorrect way first, which goes like this. I was at home. I was looking at the photos. And then I saw that. And then I panicked. I ran to the office. I came here. And then I got everything together. And now I'm here with you guys. So that's a bad way of telling a story. Better way of telling a story is, okay, so imagine I'm at home. I'm sitting there with my kids. I'm looking through the photos and I'm all like my empathy and uh, I'm feeling things for these photos. And then suddenly the last thing you want in the world, the last thing you get a phone call from the US. You're like, oh, shit, something's wrong. Something's up. I've missed something. <laughs> you know, that feeling of panic. So I, I tremble on my voice. I pick up the phone and there's someone on the other side and they go like, hey, where are you? And I'm like, oh, crap, I've got to run. And I just run out of the house. I run over the uh, yard. And what I don't know is, well, I'll come to that in just a moment. I run over the yard. I come in. I rig everything up. <laughs> and, and the terrible part about all of this is that when I sit down, I've got all this stuff up. And I think, OK, we're going to go live now. You guys you want me to turn on my video camera and hey do you see what I look like this is not my professional me but <laughs> sometimes you just have to play the game right so I'm sitting here now and uh, it's brilliant thanks for having me it is such a pleasure seeing you thanks okay so that's a better way you're telling the story the prep is I'm sitting at home with my kids the development is I'm running over the or well, the background is I'm run, running over the yard. The development is what happens here, and the conclusion is that I'm happy with to be with you guys. What's great about this is giving it the first example, and you gave yeah. us all the data points, and mm -hmm. we can all understand that, but there's certainly no emotions involved. But what did you add for the emotions to kick in? Well, I immediately felt the emotions kick in when you mentioned I was sitting there with my children. We mm -hmm. were looking at some old photos. So now, we understand what how precious the time is with spending with our children, looking at old photos where you're probably telling some stories to your children and eliciting some emotions from them and, and creating this environment. We can all understand what a surreal and beautiful moment that is, only to be all of a sudden alerted that you were missing an appointment and you were in the wrong place to now have to drop everything that is going on but, and running to the office so, and, and, and of course prepping yourself for the interview that's going to be at hand. I mean, there are so many emotional bids there that, that I felt shift and engage uh, from both stories and j just that small sample. Mm, yeah, no, it's, those four steps they're brilliant. Uh, we can get back to them. Hey, let's play a game, guys. Are you with me on that? Yes. yes. The storytelling game. Yeah. All right. So you'll do it to me first, and then I'll do it to you. Okay. So the thing is, and this is this is such a brilliant exercise. We do it in the workshops, and uh, anyone who's listening at the moment can just do it straight away. I promise you, will you will be the favorite parent of all parents if you got kids. If you do this. It's, it's, it's beautiful. Okay, so that's the prep. Did you hear the prep? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so I've built up anticipation now. Okay, so the next step is, well, the background of this is that I want you to tell me, to give me an object and a place. So I want you to give me a place and an object. And as soon as I say the word, the objects, the name of the object, I want you to give me another object. And then when I've said that, I want you to give me another object. And we'll do that three times. And I'm going to tell you a story based on those random objects that you give me. And the conclusion of all of this is that that will really teach you how to be fast in storytelling. And that's what I want to teach you. So give me a place. Give me an object. As soon as I say the word, give me another object. All right. Gym, treadmill. I don't know if you guys, if you've been at the gym, but... What's brilliant in the gym is that you can go either you can go and you can lift weights or you can go in and you can do yoga or you can do you can be, you know, a bit of everywhere. But the, the place I love, the place I love is the treadmill. So I go on the treadmill and now you got to give me another word. Towel. So this is too easy. You can't go there. 
All right, I'll, I'll do that one, but the next one has to be complicated. Okay, so I'm on the treadmill, I'm, I'm treading away, and then I'm, I'm starting to sweat profoundly. And to the right of me, there's this beautiful, beautiful girl who I'm really like attracted to. But I can feel the sweat just pouring down my chest, my back, and, the, and it's starting to smell, because do you know what I forgot? I forgot the one thing you cannot forget, which is my towel. Motorcycle. So I'm like, oh, no, this is bad. And I'm, I'm seeing my chances just, they're flying away. I won't get this girl. And then suddenly the thing happens that you don't want to happen. S this guy pulls up outside of the window and he's as cool as you come. And you can see the girl going like, whoa, here's my superhero coming. And if it's not enough that he looks like a supermodel, he dresses like a supermodel, but he comes in on this really hot, sexy motorcycle. And he jumps off the motorcycle, comes into the gym, goes to the treadmill to the right of the girl, and of course, they hook up. All because I obviously forgot my towel, and I haven't got a motorcycle. All right, so that's, yeah, just telling spontaneous stories. You did it way too easy for me, though, man. You're gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna get you now. Okay. Are you with me? I'm ready. Yeah. All right. Here we go. So the place would be the Eiffel Tower, and the object would be a um, an owl. Okay. So I'm sitting with my fiance Amy just next to the Eiffel Tower on this beautiful lawn, and we're opening up our picnic basket. We're excited to open this beautiful bottle of French wine that we've been salivating over after purchasing. And out of the corner of my eye, I see an owl swoop out of a tree. Treadmill. And, and as this owl swoops down to catch this mouse, I start running because I'm now nervous that the owl is going to come attack our food. And as I'm running, I trip and fall. And Amy yells at me that I should have exercised a little bit harder on the treadmill so that I kept my balance and, and actually would have been in good enough shape to scare away this owl. Coca-Cola. Thankfully, inside of our beautiful picnic basket, not only did we have that gorgeous bottle of wine, but we also had a one liter bottle of Coca-Cola. It's the only thing that could quench my thirst after such a dangerous run. Okay, you got to finish now then with a UFO. <laughs> uh, as I'm sipping on this Coca-Cola and satisfying, quenching my thirst out of the corner of my eye yet again, this is a wild day in Paris, obviously, owls and mice. <laughs> and I notice an object that it doesn't look like a plane, and it certainly doesn't look like an owl. Uh, I couldn't help but think to myself that it was a UFO. True. Yes. Could be. Could be. Good point. Well done. Okay. An applaud from Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so the cool thing with this exercise is that when you when you know how to spontaneously tell stories like that, so the first step is to learn to do stories like that. Do it with your friends, do it with your kids, you two do it together in the studio. And then when you've learned to tell spontaneous stories like this, what you do then is that you add the structure to it. So then you add a prep and a background and a development and a conclusion to that. So you start practicing that in real time spontaneously on that kind of story. And when you want to really add the next level to it, you add senses. So smell, taste, emotion, feeling, yeah, goosebumps, so on and so forth. And if you want to really top it off, you want to become really super brilliant, you start adding different kind of uh, signaling substances to it consciously. Dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins, testosterone, and so on and so forth. So yeah, got some practicing. Yeah, one thing that I noticed about the story examples, especially yours, was this taking of the emotion and, and adding a sense of actual like physical feeling to it. So mm. not just saying I was nervous, but you know, my, my fist clenched and, and mm. having that physicality that ties to the emotion, I feel like creates such a visceral response in the audience. Like they can feel the emotion with you. That's a good one. And let's talk about this uh, angels cocktail that you just discussed, right? Cause these four signals that you cover in your angels cocktail are so important in, in creating this dynamic in the story to allow the audience to be fully engaged. Can you unpack mm -hmm. those again for the audience? Sure. Yeah. So we have four basic signaling substances 
so let's say five signaling substances and hormones which control our emotions they are our emotions our emotions are signaling substances and hormones chemicals in our brain and um, what's interesting is depending on which one has a high concentration it will influence your psychology so if you have a high concentration of oxytocin you will tend to be more generous more feel more empathy and you'll uh, feel more bonding with the person and the second one is serotonin now, serotonin is produced when we feel pride or when we feel significant and uh, so any story which increases serotonin will make the other person feel more significant increase their self-worth and they'll feel more pride the third one is dopamine which is expectation and it's the easily the most important one so i won't take that one now i'll go to number four instead uh, we'll cover endorphins endorphins is something that just makes you less critical and it'll make you a happier person and you'll be more willing to listen to whatever is being said more accepting now the last one is testosterone and testosterone will make you more risk-taking so if I in a story induce testosterone in you you will become more risk-taking as a human being okay I think that was that or maybe we should go back to dopamine and just descri describe that just a little bit more yeah can't, can't leave that can't leave that hanging yeah. there okay so dopamine is created when you get cliffhangers and uh, mm, dopamine is behind all motivation so I'll put it like this every single time you sit in an audience and you lose focus from whoever is speaking or presenting and if you're turning this pot off it means that you are getting dopamine from somewhere else because you are addicted to it so dopamine creates focus creativity mm. memory focus creativity memory and motivation would you say that those are important things in any story or any presentation absolutely <laughs> yeah because just imagine that the next time you deliver a presentation nobody's focused motivated nor creative nor do they remember anything that you just said yeah so that's the reason why we turn off tv series that's the reason why we turn off movies it's because we simply were not stimulated enough by the desire to know what's happening next do you and obviously uh, we can all understand the importance of of these and with and with dopamine being able to create them and i think a, a lot of us uh look for opportunities to get more motivation or to get more focus and get better memory throughout yeah. throughout the day with the technology that is in front of us do you see any issues with our dopamine re receptors being either overly stimulated and more and, and it's going to take more and more now or is it uh, simply desensitized to a lot of uh, different stimulus yeah well easily over our dopamine receptors are overstimulated we're desensitized absolutely to a certain extent I think the problem today is that our attention span is so 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 so, so much shorter than it was before yeah, um, yeah. in in the past in the good old days yes it was way 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 longer so the problem today is that we are we can get dopamine uh, injections like immediately by just bringing up our phone checking social media mm -hmm. checking candy crush or TikTok or <laughs> whatever and Im you can just imagine you every single time you do that you bring out a needle and you go <laughs> in your veins every single time every single time you do that and and I call dopamine the fabricated happiness so dopamine is fabricated happiness and the less happier you are with your life the more you are you want dopamine because it gives you that quick quick hit but the problem is that you go tss, ah, <laughs> life is beautiful and then you go and you go tss, ah, tss, ah, and that is your life it goes up so up and down up and down up and down up and down so yeah the problem with that is that it is so hard to hold someone's attention when presenting speaking or even during a pod show and it, the attention span is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller because all these facebook youtube did you know that youtube 
72% of everything that you watch is is uh, recommended by the artificial intelligence mm-hmm. engine. Yep. It's insane. And it's optimized for you to look at things that ha- grabs your attention as fast and as much as possible. But you know what? I usually say this. The people living today who will die within the next 20 to 30 years, that is our last generation of storytellers. It is the last generation of storytellers. Those who lived before the television came by me, those who, who, who listened to their grandfathers and grandmothers when they told stories. This is an art which is dying, but what's, and what's sad with that is that I can have kids in front of me, totally addicted to TikTok, totally addicted to YouTube, but they will drop their phones and listen to a story because it kicks ass with anything out there. So looking at those molecules and obviously their importance in generating emotions, how can we as storytellers elicit those emotional responses and those chemicals in the audience? You can, well, let's start with the most important one, which is dopamine. You should add hooks to your story. Add hooks to your story. Uh, which means that in your story, you should say that something is coming up, but not exactly what. Simple example could be that a sh- very short story is of a man who got out of bed. But as he was getting out, things seemed to be just a little bit too quiet around him. It didn't bother much, but he walked toward the door. And the door was open, and he knew that he'd closed it when he'd gone to bed, and nobody was at home then. But still, it was too quiet. So he walks out. He walks up to the balcony and looks down. And there he sees exactly what he knew that he'd never wanted to see in his entire life. But it was there, straight in front of him. And there you go. That's dopamine for you. <laughs> yeah, what's there? <laughs> We're hanging on <laughs> cliffhanger. Yeah. Okay, so okay, cliffhangers so, yeah. elicit that focus, motivation, better memory. What can we do with oxytocin to elicit that? Uh, oxytocin is bonding with a character or an object. So bonding with a character or an object. And uh, that's the reason why you have so much junk in your cellars and in your attics. It's because you've bonded with the items there. You feel for them through oxytocin. And it feels like you get ripped apart when somebody would throw them away. So, yeah, you would uh, you would create you would create a character which we would feel for. And you know what's almost terrible with oxytocin? It is that we fall for it and we crave it so badly that we can even we can even bypass our morals and ethics. I'll give you an example from Breaking Bad. You know the show Breaking Bad? Yeah, of course. Okay. So people all over the world, they've been watching Breaking Bad. What's sad with that is that people behind the TV screens, they're going like, yeah, yeah, come on, brew more meth, man, go, yeah, brew it, yeah, brew, big an industry, build an industry, become a magnet, become a drug king, shoot the police, yes, just win over them, you can own this, yes, and, and I know this is, this is smuggled to kids, and kids die from it, but still brew more, and we're on the other side, and we're rooting for the bad guy like we're insane, and that is the power of oxytocin, if you as an author, you write for in this case, what was his name? Uh, the, the main character of Breaking Bad. Walter Bart. White. Yeah. And what did he have? Well, he had cancer. Uh, cancer. Cancer, yeah. So this story wouldn't have worked if he didn't have cancer. Um, but because we feel empathy for him through the cancer, uh, we can, fos- you know, we can we can bypass other things, bad things that he do because, you know, it's at the end of his life and so on and so forth. So that bonding, that connection is what elicits oxytocin. And endorphin, creativity, relaxation, focus. How can we elicit this in a story? I'm, uh, I'm really sorry, guys, but uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't. I can't remember. Um, let's move over to endorphins. Okay, so you're laughing at the moment, which means that I induced endorphins in you, which mm-hmm. is great. So that is uh, the simple thing with endorphins: just make people laugh, tell jokes, adding some humor. Add humor to your stories, yeah. And testosterone risk-taking, that one seems a little more challenging. Testosterone, yeah, that could be challenging, but no, you just tell hero stories, really. So I could tell you a hero story, and uh, what's good with that hero story is that it induces both um, testosterone and serotonin. 
and um, it goes like this the man was 20 years old he looked back at his life and he uh, concluded that this was not what he intended this is not what he wanted at 15 years of age he'd been thrown out from home after fighting with his brother he'd made a woman pregnant he had a child the woman had left him he'd um, put a company into bankruptcy and he said to him said in a self sad voice this was not what I intended in my life but he was a smart and clever guy he wasn't religious specifically but he loved the idea by having words and laws to live by so what he did he took a piece of paper and wrote down the 12 things that he wanted to become and at the top he wrote the date or the, or the days of the month so it was kind of two axes one axis with things he wanted to be and one axis with the days of the month he walked over to his friend and said look at this look at this this is brilliant what a method I've come up with and the friend was far from happy the friend said ah oh, I don't know that's uh, silly why is it silly well because you're none of them uh, well that's the problem that's why my life looks the way it looks and the friend said hey if you're gonna do this you should add a 13th because my god you need it add humility and this guy went, mm, humility, he tasted it. Hmm, yeah. Okay, cool. We'll go with humility. And this, this uh, guy was far from humble because what he wrote, he wrote behind each of these, he wrote what they were meant. And behind humility, he wrote no less than Socrates or Jesus, which is far from humble, I think. And then he began life. He became an author. He became... An inventor and a true story he invented the iron stove he invented the, uh, uh, the difficult glasses the swim feet and the lightning rod but all that pales in comparison to when we know now that he founded the first library and the first insurance company in the US but all that pales in comparison because he also is seen to be one of the fathers or the main father behind the American Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. But that also pales in comparison that he was the trusted advisor of the three first presidents of the United States of America, George Washington, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Now, when uh, he died at 82, he'd written in his diary at 81, Benjamin Franklin wrote, because that was his, was his name, you can find him on the $100 bills in the U.S. today, and he's seen to be one of the most influential characters of the U.S. history. He wrote in his diary when he was 81, I became what I wanted because one day I chose who I wanted to be. So, fellow listeners, when did you choose who you wanted to be? Because apparently... It can have a tremendous effect. The end. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. So how did we elicit testosterone and serotonin in that story? Well, probably more serotonin, but you get a feel for that. You go like, mm -hmm. wow, that's a pretty cool person. And you feel, also, you don't feel envy, but you feel that you want to go home and you maybe you just want to do something systematically different in your life because you you sense that you have a power over your, your, over your life. So I would say that that would be, but then a testosterone is, is always released when you win and he won. Right. But if I wanted to induce pure testosterone, I would probably give you more of a, uh, an even bigger success uh, like and, and more masculinity more nakedness more hardcore more risk so like a warrior story a hero's journey yeah like a hero warrior mm -hmm. and obviously looking at these stories and their importance in communication personally we know they connect us and, and bind us together but they're also used in business so you look at presenting ideas, selling, pitching, trying to go to networking events. We talked about this in networking last month. And I feel like a lot of us sort of don't view them the same. And, and what is your view on that? Whether we're personally telling stories or we're telling, sharing these stories professionally, do these rules still apply? Absolutely. Yeah. No question about it. Nah, no question about it. Hey, a quick tip for you is this. 
just as you did there with the example where you wrote down events that happened to you, what you can do is what I would recommend every single person on this pod to do and you too. Write down the stories that you tell. You can just use the title. You don't have to word them word by word, just the titles. And you use Excel or, or something similar. You write down all your stories in one column and then the power comes when you start indexing them. So the powers that people laugh at, index them as endorphins. People that, the stories that people feel empathy for, index them as oxytocin. People that, well, the stories that people feel uh, success and pride in, index them as serotonin. Stories that people feel mm, that they, they cannot l stop listening to. You always got their absolute, absolute anticipation. I can tell you one of those later if you want to. But <laughs> one of those super hardcore dopamine stories. Then you just, um, you classify that as dopamine. And if you tell the stories where you, after you've told the story, people are like really hungry. They, you can see them, their eyes, that they want to do something, they want to win something. You classify that as testosterone. And you do that with every single one of your stories. And imagine that you have 100 stories. That means that you now have 100 more or less weapons in your pocket. Because if you walk into a crowd and you go like, mm -hmm, these need oxytocin. And they might need a bit of endorphins. Let's see what we have. Ha ha. I'll take this one and I'll take this one. And then you just launched them at them in the first 10 minutes. And how do we make that angel's cocktail? How do we mix those together? Oh, well, it would just be a story which combines all of them. So a story which builds anticipation is dopamine. A story where you are attracted to the character or the object, which is oxytocin. And it ends with a, with a hero kind of grand finale, which is serotonin, and maybe a laugh here and there, which is endorphins. Yeah, and that would be your angel's cocktail. But I would recommend not mixing angel's cocktails. I would recommend taking the story that you indexed, which is high on one or two of the signaling substance and launch that at them. They don't need complete angel's cocktails. That is just... That's just a synonym uh, for if you, should, you know, if you want to entertain someone. The power mm -hmm. lies in picking them. Right. So understanding the underlying emotions of the stories, what they elicit in the audience, categorizing them so that you yep. have them available when you need them. And then, of course, yeah. practicing them. Right. And paying attention to the audience as you develop out these stories so that you have one for each of those categories. Absolutely. Most definitely. And one of your other famous TEDx talks is the death of the PowerPoint. And when you <laughs> think about presenting in business. We think about presenting on stage, oftentimes we are using a PowerPoint and yeah. we do change our view of sharing stories and connecting with the audience when there's slides behind us and there's words on the screen. So mm -hmm. we talked a little bit earlier about this. It is no different, whether you're telling stories personally, whether you're telling stories at a networking event or even you're on stage, we need to be eliciting emotions in the audience. We want their attention. We want their focus. How can we do that when PowerPoint is involved? Yeah, good point. All right, so I would say that you can still kick ass with dopamine. Uh, so a couple of quick tips is the following. Um, imagine that you bring out a slide and you go, uh, okay, this one. Ah, we could probably skip this one. Oh, no. Oh, I know you can't really read what's on it, but uh, yeah, so uh, I'll just point here. Yeah, that's a bad way of, <laughs> of delivering a slide. Okay, so that is bringing the dopamine down to, to the floor. Now, a better way, the magical way of delivering a slide is what I call sell your slide. And it goes like this. Just prior to delivering the slide, you go, oh, guys, girls, the next slide coming up is my personal favorite. It summarizes everything in such a beautiful way. So just hold on to your seats. Here we go. Boom. And the dopamine is sky high. People are going like, <laughs> can't do that every single time. Can't go. Next slide is my personal favorite. They'll, they'll carry you away if you do that for more than like two <laughs> slides. But you can still sell slides. You can go like, okay, so we've had, we've had a look at the theory. Let's have a look at a super exciting example of how this works. And then you bring that out. So <clears throat> dopamine can be used by selling stories, uh, selling slides, sorry. Yeah, so that's one 
there's so many ways to create dopamine in PowerPoint, but I right. don't know how much you want me to talk about it, but that's one key way. Well, that's a great example. Are there yeah. other emotions in, in your PowerPoint that you feel are important? Yeah, yeah absolutely. The second one would be just value everything that you say. You know, like you go like, ah, oh, look at this number. That's a bit worrisome. Ah, oh, I hate this number. Look at this. This excites the heck out of me. Do you see that number? That's eight to six. It's incredible. When you go like, ooh, I don't know. You know, I'm feeling really, really bothered by this number. This is really getting to me. And it's the end of the month. I don't know. So yeah, value your numbers because every single time you do that, you transfer your emotion to the people listening. And hmm, you know what? Can we? Is it okay to just do a quick experiment with you two guys? Yeah, sure, of yeah. course. Okay, and, and of course you who you who's listening as well. Do the same thing. Okay, so grab a pen and paper. Do you have a pen and paper, guys, or do you have anything to? Yeah, we have some notes here you we have, can write on. You have pads, okay. Yeah. All right, and you as a listener as well grab a pen and paper, write down the, um, let's see, the three last things that you've purchased just spontaneously. Three last things that you've purchased. Okay. So it can be, can be water, it can be a car, a uh, jet plane, can be <laughs> candy, <laughs> hamburger. I'll just give you a moment to write that down. All right. So we could make this list like 30 items long, but three is enough. All right, now I just discussed you two guys in between each other. Yeah. What what drove those decisions? You have three options to to pick between. Either it was instincts that drove those decisions, or it was emotions, or it was logic. So three things. You can pick one of those. What drove those decisions? Instinct, emotion, and logic. And while you two guys do it, you who's you who's listening do it as well. So discuss what drove those decisions. All right. So AJ, you want to start with yours? Yeah. Should I identify the objects? Yeah. Okay. So swimsuit was emotional. Okay. Coffee was instinctual. And uh, so was tofu. All right. Um, protein bar was instinctual. Water <laughs> was instinctual. And uh, uh, beer was just needed at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> That's pure emotion, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right so what's fascinating you did you guys did really well and and it's a thumbs up on all those good answers uh, but what's interesting is when i do say that i've got an audience of a thousand people i'm delivering a keynote for them and i ask this question so everyone in the audience they write down three things and then they get to discuss exactly this it is 40 percent of the audience who come to the conclusion that you two guys came to 60 percent of the audience believe that their de decisions are rational and logical Right, but the conclusion of this is, and you who are listening, the conclusion is this, that every single decision you've taken in your entire life, and you will take for the rest of your life, every single decision is driven by emotion or instinct. There are no exceptions. And so why I'm saying this and why I just wanted to jump into this is because you guys, you're talking about emotion and we're talking about, about the signaling substance and hormones. Mm -hmm. why, this, why this is absolute core, why this is more important than anything is because if you walk into a meeting room, a conference room, a presentation, and you do not elicit an emotion into those who, li who are listening, you will not move them. You will not make them take a decision. They will nod. They will smile. They will sign. They will walk out of there, and something else will attract their emotion, and boom, they're off in that direction. If you fail to create that, you fail to move people. And that is why emotion in PowerPoint is so important. And that is why these signaling substances are so important to pick. Well, we've certainly seen it uh, many times. And was a, a lot of the clients that we have can be very overly analytical. And, and we'll talk about sometimes when they're going into a meeting where they're putting together their PowerPoint presentation. And I will laugh because at the end of the day, they put most of their efforts in the slides and the, and the, and making sure <laughs> that the facts are up there, the numbers all work, work out. out and, and, and I can't count how many folks that we've had in here who do pitches for a living or do marketing and are like, throw all that out. <laughs> Let's make sure that you walk in <laughs> busting with emotion and to elicit whatever you need. You're going to have to first feel it in yourself. 
and it, 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 it never ceases to amaze me because you know of course if you're going to school for this it's going to be all the data points that are going to that you think is going to drive this home but in actuality you're not in the room if your data points didn't make out you're you're in the room because they want you to get them emotionally excited about what you have to offer yeah yeah simple as that yeah, yeah with emotions sure. driving decisions it's important that we at least pay attention to them when we're presenting when we're sharing stories of course they connect us and in your TEDx talk on death by PowerPoint, we'll link it up in the show notes. You go into great detail around some slide structure for all of you who are interested in presenting, especially slides. Why do you think people put so much emphasis on the slide deck itself and, and don't pay attention to the emotion and, and realize the delivery? We believe that we are rational human beings <laughs> and that our decisions are rational and logical. And if they are, uh, well, then we can focus on, on logic. And therefore, we build slides which are truly logical. I think if we were, if we truly would have a sense that our decisions are driven by emotion, if we knew that for real and we could feel it all the way into our bone, we would build presentations differently. But we just, I don't think we can, people just don't relate to it. It's like I said, 60% they believe that every single decision they take is rational or driven by rational. Well, we could see it in a lot of our, the, the entertainment that is around us is certainly going to uh, elicit a lot of emotion, but even the information that's presented to us, if we look at all the, the political strife going on kind of everywhere, but it's all emotionally driven. Uh, there may be some data points behind it, but there's going to be a narrative that gets you riled up in order for you to buy into whatever uh, these sides are, are peddling. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. the other key point in all of this, and I know you, you talk about it in your course as well, is first impression. We talk about it in our boot camp, how important it is to set the tone with a great first impression. Of course, it's going to hook the audience. It's going to get their attention to whatever you're presenting or even sharing stories. What are your thoughts around creating a compelling first impression and its impact in our storytelling? Yeah, absolutely. Super important. I call it the halo effect and the hell effect, or I call it, well, it is commonly referred to that you can make a first impression in two ways, hell or halo. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, interesting studies have shown that if you, are, if you are interviewing a person for a job and they are three minutes late, that will impact your, your entire perspective of this person during the entire interview. So yeah, uh, the hell and the halo effect is incredibly important. So I put a lot of, I put a, a lot of effort into making the po best possible first impression that I can. Not overdoing it, but still making it as good as possible. And when you're on stage and you have to present, whether it's slides or share a story or, or give a keynote, what are you focusing on in terms of your first impression to engage the audience? Uh, well, I run a seven step psychologically beneficial structure and I, I, I hit every single point of those every single time I present and I, I see too that I know my structure and I know my beginning, my first three minutes flawlessly. It's like I could, you could wake me in the middle <laughs> of the night and I would go like, boom, 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 boom. You could pick any of my keynotes and I could do my seven steps in a split second. Uh, that that's what's important to me and uh, that's when I do keynotes or presentations if I meet a person like I'm meeting you or I'm in a one-to-one -one meeting uh, my beginning would be different of course I would listen a lot more right and when you're talking about that first three minutes what is the key focus for you uh, building uh, well I listen into which signaling substance they're low in and then I counteract that with bringing up the signaling substance that I think they or I desire in order for the meeting to have a great outcome. So there's reading the room, obviously some emotional intelligence there to understand where the signals are high and low for the audience and then working to manage those to your advantage. Yeah, yeah, so a simple one would be, say that a person is, I, I'll, yeah, one example, um, I had a meeting about a year ago. I went into the room, there were three gentlemen sitting in there they were all highly ethos individuals. So very strong, very cocky. They didn't really want me there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what I had to do is I had to break their ethos to begin with, to bring their serotonin down to normal levels. 
and you can't just go in and and give someone a tell-off when you're going into a meeting like that so you have to do it indirectly so the way i did it was that i walked into these guys and i said uh, well I, I, I uh, shook their hands, I greeted them, I gave them a compliment of some sort, and just before I sat down, I said, J just before, so, so that I don't forget, just before I sit down, just so that I don't forget, I, I, I was sitting outside, and while I was waiting for you, I read through your brochure, and in your brochure, it says that you work with um, these different types of pedagogy. Now, as, as you know as well, as, as well as I know, it's called that the word is androgogy because obviously you teach adults and you don't teach children. So I just wanted you to know that because whoever uh, wrote that copy, you know, <laughs> just have them check that just as a helpful thing. Okay, let's get on with the meeting. Now, obviously they were the guys who wrote this, but obviously they didn't know that pedagogy is teaching children and androgogy is teaching adults. And I indirectly give them, gave them a, um, I lowered their serotonin, their confidence. So yeah, identifying that, that mistake for them, <laughs> calling it out indirectly in yeah. a way that doesn't attack them, lowers their serotonin, lowers that cockiness, balances out the room. Yeah. So that could be one, one way to do it. Yeah. So understanding, it sounds a lot of whether we're telling stories or, or giving presentations or pitching, that the understanding of the audience is the most important step. I feel like a lot of us, when we're trying to memorize our stories or memorize our presentations, we're thinking about all the slides. Uh, oftentimes we're not paying close attention to the audience. What are some of the yeah, key I've... things that you're focusing on when you're paying attention to the audience? Is there body language signals that you're noticing? Uh, yeah. So two answers to that. When I build my Ted talks, they are roughly 18 minutes long. It took me 70 hours per TED talk to build and rehearse. So I do not listen to my audience for a single second when I deliver those. I just, I know and presume their reaction and action to every single thing that I'll be saying because it's pre-planned. Uh, and I don't deliver the TED talk for the people in the room. Even like in Stockholm, there was a thousand people listening. I do not deliver it for them. I deliver it for YouTube and do doing that is just different so yeah that is one version if you have 70 hours to prepare an 80 minute presentation in your life if you don't it's listening to the audience and my third ted talk is called the 110 steps of the 110 techniques or the 110 steps of excellence where i spent seven years studying 5,000 speakers and presenters. And I think I became the first person in the world who detailed every single communication skill human beings use when we communicate. I don't know, I haven't, I haven't seen anyone else do it. And what's interesting with this is that why I want to do, what I want to come to is this, that have you ever walked into a room and you immediately feel that you don't trust the person? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And probably the opposite, where you met a person and you go like, Oh, God, I love you from almost the first instance. You've been there? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So after studying these 5,000 individuals, I, I learned to understand that we have five layers of communication. And uh, the five layers are facial expression, word, voice, body language, and gesture. Now, what's interesting, when you walk into a room where you can't trust a person, there is a discrepancy in their communication. There's something not lining up between these five to an example could then be that they say hey so good to see you and you can hear in their voice that yeah it's fairly okay you know it's good but their facial expression is not saying the same thing as their voice and when there's a discrepancy in any one of these five layers you immediately sense it you don't know what it is. I can because I've broken it down to 110 different things. <laughs> but a normal human being wouldn't be able to pinpoint exactly what is wrong in this situation. So when looking at the audience, um, you should read into the audience to uh, in regards to these five layers. Have a look at their facial expression. Have a look at their body language. Have a look at their gestures. What's interesting then is that they have to be in synchronicity, i.e. if they got folded arms and at the same time they're smiling, that doesn't mean that they're negative. So these have to be, the more they are in synchronicity, the more true you can read a person. So under you, yeah, yeah, understanding those five layers and the more congruence there is between the five, the more accurate that reading of that person is. 
So if someone has crossed arms and a big smile and those are the only two signals you're seeing, you can't really say that they're either closed off or, or they're happy. Absolutely not. No, they, yeah. And looking at obviously something like a TEDx talk, even in the 70 hours of prep, I'm assuming you were paying close attention in your delivery multiple times to read and sense how the room is going to react. And after practicing it enough times, you can start to make those assumptions that these are the moments that people laugh at. These are the moments that people are really engaged. These are the moments where I know I'm, I'm going to get their full attention, et cetera. Yes, absolutely. So obviously, understanding making a great first impression understanding how these chemicals influence our emotions and working to the best of your abilities to evoke these emotions in your audience and a lot of practice is how we can mm -hmm. become more effective storytellers yeah absolutely i would say that to simplify it go with the first thing that i said look at all the situations in your life package it in those four structures where you have the prep the background, the development, and the conclusion. If that is the only thing that you practice, it'll make you a 500% or a 1000% of a better storyteller within just six months. And then you can add the other layers on top of that, but that'll make the, the biggest difference. I, I think the other thing that most people need to realize is, yes, this is a skill that can be developed, but it's, it is within all of us. We have evolved through storytelling oh, yeah. we have learned through storytelling and so it, f for all the times that we hear well I can't, i'm not a good storyteller or for all the times that we hear well i don't have any good stories to, to, to tell well that's just that is just untrue you just haven't given yourself those opportunities to bring out what is already there uh, inside yeah absolutely and to de-dramatize de it just don't call it storytelling, for God's sake. Just yeah. just retell a daily thing that happened to you in that structure that I just mentioned, and boom, you have a story. It's not that is simple, and just a really quick one as well. As you haven't asked me about that, how how long does something have to be in order to be a story? Okay, so the shortest story ever written was <laughs> uh, written by Ernst Hemingway. It's six words, and it goes like this. It's a sad one. It's oxytocin. Okay. Are you ready for it? Yeah. It goes like this. Baby shoes. Never worn. For sale. Okay. So that's a story. Because what happens when I tell you that story is that it puts images in your head. Mm -hmm. And those images are associated to emotions and references and associations that you have to children who may not have been born. And those emotions are then created through your own fantasy and your own memories. I didn't need to create them in my story. I simply placed the words in your head. So then to argue that stories can be even shorter. What? Can they be even shorter than six words? Yeah, they can because metaphors are the shortest definition of a story right. because sh metaphors they create images in your head and to those images you have associations and memories and those create emotions so if i were to say hey have you seen the boys room oh it looks like havoc in there or you mm -hmm. go have you seen the boys room it looks like an absolute tornado going on in there okay so the second would bring out much more emotion and associations in you so yeah, stories don't have to, it's not, it's not this complicated thing. Just look at it as a story. You create visuals in, a, in, in, in the head, in the brain of the people listening, and those, those create, or they, they are associated to memories and they create emotions. Yeah, it's that transfer of emotions and you don't have to be verbose to do it, as you just no. described. I think a lot of times exactly that. When we hear storytelling, we tend to, overthink it and overanalyze it and try to add all this fluff to it and overcomplicate it and really being more willing to share and practice and look for opportunities to share those daily moments, uh, especially the ones you've categorized, paying attention to the audience. Are you evoking that emotion, seeing that signaling back uh, is a great yep. way to, to strengthen the skill set. Mm -hmm. The last Absolutely. question I have for a lot of us mm -hmm. who give keynotes or, or have to present our ideas, I think we spend a lot of time as we talked about on the slides and then prepping for the presentation. <laughs> but the one 
piece you can't really control is the audience response and questions after your mm -hmm. presentation. What is your mindset? How do you go into your presentations to handle those questions? Because we do know that sometimes the audience can throw some tough questions our way. Yeah. Okay, so whenever I build a keynote or a, a, an entire course for that sake, uh, I, I always look into what kind of objections can the audience come up with. And then I build in a, I don't know what you call that, a pre-objection. Uh, what do you call that? I lost the word. Objections. Yeah. So to hand, yeah. Okay. So yeah. So I then ask myself, how can I handle that objection? I build that into my keynote so that the objection never can never happen. It never happens. Uh, so when you listen to my keynotes, they are usually at least like 99.5% bulletproof. Mm -hmm. Uh, if they do come, or if you know that they will be coming, see to it that you induce serotonin and endorphins into your audience, because that will reduce the likeliness of questions like that popping up at the end. And I would say the third one, is there a third thing you can do? Yeah, control questions. Okay, so the, the biggest mistake you can do is end your presentation with questions. You should always own your ending. And an ending has three steps. The first step should be questions. So you go, before I summarize, are there any questions? We have four minutes for questions. Uh. Then you do the summary and then you do, do the grand finale. The grand finale is super important because you need to in inflict emotion into their brain, go <laughs> But But the trick here is to go, before I summarize, are there any questions? We have four minutes. Now you control the entire agenda because after four minutes you can go, okay, time's up. We, uh, we have to continue now. And then it's perfectly okay. If you haven't said that, it is rude to go in and stop them. But now right. you have the full authority to do so. And of course that gives you an opportunity if for whatever reason you may have fumbled an answer or not felt good about a response to a question to come back in the summarization and in the grand finale and fix that. So you're not leaving that presentation on a low note where the audience might be doubting your understanding or your viewpoint because of a question you were posed. Exactly. exactly. So, and are there key steps in the summary? And it sounds like there are important pieces to the grand finale. As we get to the grand finale of this interview, what are you looking yeah. for to summarize? And, and what is that last piece in the grand finale? Well, I love ending whatever, keynote presentation I do with a story. So I, I told you earlier that I have this really, really high injection dopamine story. So I'd like to end with that if that's okay with you. Yes. Fantastic. Uh, and as a summary, yeah, I would like, I just, I just love giving content and knowledge to everyone that can listen and, and need, who I need of it. So just look at my three Ted talks. That's an awesome summary. Learn from them. But if, if there's anything in storytelling, it is what I just said previously. And that is just get down there and practice the four steps in the storytelling structure in your every single day life. That will make a tremendous difference. And my third point, because you should only have three things in a summary, not four, not five, but three. So this is the third and the last one. And this is the one that will make you most popular of all in any party, at any dinner, at uh, uh, with your kids as a parent, as I said, and that is the spontaneous storytelling exercise we did. Give the person, give your kid, six years old, a place and an object. Let them tell, tell, let them tell a story, and then boom, another object, boom, another object, boom, another object. You'll be rolling down on the floor, you'll be laughing, you'll be having such a good time. You can do this in a taxi, you can do it on a bus, you can do it wherever you want to. And every single time you do it, you teach them how to do storytelling and you teach yourself to do storytelling. So those three things would be core summaries for me. So this, this, this is the story that changed my perspective on storytelling and it just did so forever. And it's an old tale. And as with old tales, they began a long, long, long time ago. This is a Jewish tale and uh, it takes place in the Middle East in a small, small village. And at the edge of this small, small village, there's a small little beautiful house. And in this small, beautiful house lived two women. And these two women were the most beautiful women you can ever imagine. Now, these two women were sisters. And uh, the one sister's name was Story. 
and the other sister's name was Truth. Now, there was a inherent problem with them thinking that they were beautiful because they were constantly arguing who was the most beautiful. And this particular day, this argument grew into a growl and they started fighting on who was the most beautiful and they couldn't agree. And so they stopped and they say, hey, we cannot agree who is the most beautiful of us two. Let's have a contest. Let's walk down the middle street of our town and see who attracts most attention. So they went to bed, the morning rose, they walked up to the street and they stood in front of the, of, uh, of the street and then uh, Truth said, hey, can I go first, sister? And Story said, yes, of course. So Truth, she, she, so she stood firmly, she looked down the street and she boosted her self-confidence and she started walking down. As she walked down, you could see the kids playing football. They ran away. You could see the families who were having picnic. They quickly put all their food back in the basket and they walked away. The people behind the blinds, they closed them at, at the top of the roofs. People, the children, they walked back. So they didn't want to see what they saw. When Truth came to the end of the road, she asked herself, why am I not beautiful? Why are people not attracted to me? And she thought, is there any other way I can become even more attractive? And she came up with this brilliant idea. And she unbuttoned her cloak and she let it drop. And there she was, entirely naked. And now with renewed self-confidence, she walked up the street. But instead of people gathering around her, the few that were left, they fled. She came up to her sister and she said, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened, but I didn't attract anyone. And then Story said, don't worry, sister, let me try. Let's see what happens. So Story stood there. She stood, she gazed down the street. She built herself with self-confidence and then she walked down. And this time you could see the kids coming back with their footballs and they were playing on the street. You could see the children and the families they sitting down and having their picnics again. And the people behind the blinds, they opened them up. And the kids on the rooftops, they looked down. And story came to the end of the road. She turned around and she walked back. When she came back to her sister, Truth said, I'm sorry, sister, I am sorry. You are the most beautiful. You are the one who attracts them all, I have lost. I'm sorry, you are the most beautiful. And then Story said, no, that's not entirely true. It doesn't have to be true. The thing is, though, that people are not attracted by the truth. People are definitely not attracted by the naked truth. What people are attracted to is a story. But well, what people love more than anything is a true story. So Story took, took, took her cloak and wrapped it around the shoulders of her, her sister. And this time, Truth walked down the street with a cloak of Story. And every single person in the entire village, in every nearby village, flocked around her to watch the most beautiful thing we know the most attractive thing, which is a true story. Because isn't that true? That every single time you watch a movie and it comes up based on a true story, your entire brain ignites in a way that it doesn't if it's just fictional. That, my friends, is a great story and the end. Thank you for sharing and, and all these amazing storytelling tips. Where can our audience find more about your university and, and learn how to become such an amazing storyteller like yourself? Just uh, just head to jpuniversity.com and uh, you have a full full course on uh, storytelling and every single signal substance and how you inject that in other human beings um, and the 110 steps and you can learn it all there. Well, thank you so much Very for good. staying up late with us. We appreciate all the stories and the experiments you ran on us. Johnny and I enjoyed <laughs> them. Thanks for being open for that, guys. That yeah, was really good fun. I had, I had really good fun. Thanks. But I feel alive.